from the design, let's get to the numbers. Uh, we have 330,000 cubic meters of concrete in this building. We have 31,400 metric tons of reinforcing steel on this. Um, working with Bill Baker for the, for the couple of years through the design process, I learned more about structural engineering and how to confuse wind and how to not have anybody move more than 27 milli, uh, milli-g's of motion at the uppermost occupied floor. I learned an uh, incredible amount of stuff. So I'm gonna ask Bill now to come up and explain how all of that beautiful architecture actually stays up and doesn't fall down when the wind blows hard. Uh, please welcome uh, Bill Baker. He's the uh, lead uh, structural engineer from Skidmore Owings in Maryland. Five years later, uh, 160 stories in the air, and um, though we still have a ways to go. The, um, so I'm going to start talking about the structure, and you know you've seen this slide. You know it's 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 the world's tallest slope building, and it's the world's tallest building by a lot. And I'm curious if Emar is ever going to actually announce the height there, is it's going to be urban folklore, you know, about with people guessing forever as to how t how tall the building is. But, but it, it's, uh, as you can see, though, the world's tallest buildings for quite a, while, a long time, going back to the uh, Empire State Building, only got uh, a little bit bigger in each version. Every time there's a new world's tallest building, it was only slightly bigger uh, than the one before. But this uh, Burj Dubai is a lot bigger, okay? And in fact, the image you see here is actually drawn shorter than it is because we're not allowed to, uh, to uh, get, uh, let people know, so we actually scale it down uh, for, for this image. So, uh, what made it possible, okay? And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Obviously, structural systems, uh, uh, wind engineering, uh, uh, integration of systems was incredibly important. Uh, the chairman was speaking about uh, efficiencies. You've got to get this, all this stuff to work together. And of course, then the construction technology that, that, that we have available to us. Okay, uh, the systems. It's a reinforced, as you can see, it's a reinforced concrete building. Uh, if you were to stop the, the construction of super tall buildings after, say, the Sears Tower, you would say, first of all, it's going to be an office building. A uh, super tall building is going to be made in, uh, in North America, and it's going to be made of structural steel. Well, I guess the world has changed. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, basically, uh, this is a, a residential tower. It is a, uh, a concrete building, and it's certainly uh, built uh, here, here in Dubai. The uh, The... Even though it's a super tall building, the uh, componentry of it is very conventional. Uh, we worked very hard. We, uh, you, know, you know, we've done a lot of projects together over the years, and um, and we don't like design buildings that don't get built. We don't. Uh, life's too short for that. We want we want to uh, we want to work on buildings that can be actually executed. So uh, we were working very hard to be sure that we could design a building that multiple contractors could deliver. You got to get the right one, but but. But, and so, it's, as you see here, it's fairly conventional componentry. You got you got walls, you got columns, you got slabs, but it's how we put those together, the, the unique arrangement of those common elements that, that made it made it possible. And uh, Adrian referred to this uh, project that we had done uh, uh, prior to this together, uh, which was the uh, in uh, it was Tower Palace Three in uh, in Seoul, Korea. And in that process, it, it wasn't exactly the structural system, but it's very close. And it became quite obvious to me that if one wanted to go really tall, uh, with a few modifications of that system, we could really go some places. So, uh, so we had this, uh, this, uh, this uh, quick competition, and, and we, uh, we brought this, uh, this system to a, a new level. And of course, you, when you have a new structural system, you have to give it a, a new name, so we called it a buttress core. And, and basically, you see it here uh, in, in this diagram. It's a, it's, uh, a a tall building is like a giant beam sticking out of the ground, okay? And, and it has all the components of just a normal beam. It has, it has to have something to carry the shear, like what we call that a web. It has something to take the overturning moment, we call those flanges. And, and you have to figure out how to create those components 
and tie them all together in an efficient manner uh, so, so you, you can, you can uh, deal with it. Another thing that's very important is that it has to be very stiff torsionally. There's been uh, research done, there's a seminal paper by Nick Isimoff from the uh, University of Western Ontario where he looked at buildings that had complaints about motion. And they all tended to have be buildings that would twist in the wind. And, and why is that an issue? It's because if you look out your window and the building's twisting, horizon moves on you. And, and, and it'd be quite obvious. So in the middle of this building, we put this hexagonal concrete core and it acts like a giant axle that keeps this building from twisting. It's very, very, very stiff torsionally. It, it, in fact, it was very difficult in the, in the initial uh, wind tunnel models, it was very dis difficult to even measure uh, any torsional movement. The, uh, and then, uh, one of the most important things in tall buildings is you have to buy structure for, for the, to hold up the gravity loads. You have to, to buy structure to, to resist the wind and the seismic forces. But you, want, you don't want to have separate systems. You don't want to buy structure twice. You want to do it once and use it for, 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 uh, to resist all the forces. So one of the things we had to do is we had to like, spread the weight out. And so uh, every time we hit a mechanical floor, which is about every 30 floors, uh, we would tie everything together. And we, we would move the loads out and, and make them uh, uh, uniformly loaded. And, and, and we did this uh, in a way, it's, it's like spreading your feet. So as, you, as, as the load comes down, you, you keep spreading your feet, and you're spreading the load, and you make yourself much, much more stable. And it's this management of the gravity load which is essential to the efficiency. Uh, here's, here's the, uh, some uh, uh, photograph of the rebar down, at, down at, the, at the raft. Look how little rebar it takes to do a building like this. Because we're using the weight of the building to resist the wind, not rebar. And, 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 so, and, and the proportions of the building, if you look at this, you would, you would swear that this is the beginning of a 30-story building, not a, something that's over 160 stories. And, and, and the walls are relatively thin. They're about 650 millimeters at the base. Uh, the, uh, the proportions are, are, are really quite normal. Uh, the other thing that what we had to do is we used uh, high-strength concrete. And uh, James Aldridge is here somewhere in the, in the, in the crowd. Uh, and he helped develop these very high-performance mixes for this project. So we're able to use very, very strong concrete. Uh, in, in Dubai, you're blessed with very high-quality concrete uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, you know, good aggregate and, and the like. And so we were able to, to take advantage of this uh, very high uh, strength, very uh, stiff concrete. Okay, and then finally when we get to the top, uh, and because of all the setbacks that Adrian was talking about, at some point it sets back so far, there was actually somewhat, uh, it made no sense to, co to uh, continue the concrete structure because the, the efficiency of concrete uh, structures is when you keep, get, keep reusing the formwork. Keep reusing the formwork. You don't, you don't rebuild it. Uh, a lot of the formwork at the top of the building was the same formwork they started at the bottom. They just had to keep relining the, 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 the forms as, as the forms would get too much use. But at the very top, it, it becomes a steel structure. Now, it so happens, I'm on the American Institute of Steel Construction Code Committee, so I, I help uh, uh, write the specifications of the United States. And so here I am on this committee, and I'm doing this world's tallest concrete building. So, so I tell, tell my friends, it's actually the world's tallest steel building with a really large concrete uh, foundation. <laughs> the, uh, and speaking of the foundations, you, you go down to, down to the bottom. Uh, we were very lucky. We're sitting on some pretty good uh, uh, materials. It, it's, a, it's a rock material. It's a sedimentary rock. And so uh, you can see, you know, it's not a particularly onerous foundation. We had uh, one and a half meter piles, about 45 meters deep, around 194 of them. Uh, arranged around. Um, uh, Hyder out of the UK was the, was the geotechnical uh, engineer and uh, it was peer reviewed by Clyde Baker who's, who's here, here at the conference uh, today. The, and and, and the, let me go back to that. The settlements, okay? It, it, it's, it's settled less than the, the, the uh, uh, it's, it's around, it's settled about as thick as my thumb is, slightly thicker than my thumb is how much this building settled so far. Uh, and, and by the time it's done, it's going to be not quite the thickness of two thumbs. This is like trivial. Uh, you know, the, the, the system's behaving very, very well. Now, uh, the, the controlling thing in, in tall buildings is the wind. And, and here you see uh, two photographs. One, you see this vortex shedding. So as wind goes around an object, you get all these swirls. And people have talked about this in some of the technical sessions before this. 
And, and uh, on the right, you see a, a picture of a cloud going past the top of the John, Han John Hancock Tower. And you can see the vortex being formed in the clouds. And, and this is a very real f phenomenon. And what happens, as you can see, it happens first on the left-hand side, and then on the right, and then back again, and back again. And why is that important? It's like a child on a swing, OK? When a child is on a swing, and they want to go higher and higher, they just kick their feet at the natural resonance of, of the swing, because the swing is an oscillator. And they get going higher and higher and higher. And as you, as an adult, try to hold a child up that high, it's a lot of work. But they're able to do it with just their little feet. And that's because they're kicking at the natural resonance of the building. Uh, just like a swing is an oscillator, a, a, a tall building is an oscillator. So what we try to do is we try to confuse the wind. As, as, sorry, Mark, you're going to hear it again. Uh, we try to confuse the wind. And it's like having a kid who's on a swing set, and instead of kicking their feet at, at the same rate, they kick them at different rates. And Adrian talked about how the, this building has essentially uh, 27 different uh, uh, floor plates. So it's like the child has 27 different feet, and they're all kicking at different rates. And, and so, so, the, the, so it never gets that, that harmonic uh, buildup of forces. And, and it was very, very important. Uh, another thing we had to do is we had to understand uh, the wind climate. Uh, the, uh, you know, this, this building is quite tall. So uh, RWI uh, took a lot of research into, uh, into what's the nature of the wind climate in, in, this, in this region. They looked at balloon data. Every day in Abu Dhabi, they, re they released weather balloons twice a day. And, and so we got that data, RWDI got that data, and traced the, the, the velocity profile so we could see how, what is the wind like at that height? Uh, they made very sophisticated uh, regional atmospheric models to try to predict using uh, thermodynamics, you know, what's the nature of, of, of the wind layers at, at those heights? And so, so that we could, uh, as we progressed our design, we'd have confidence of, that we were uh, doing, uh, uh, sorry, taking into account what's actually happening at those great heights. And, and then, we, then we tested a lot. Uh, we immediately, as soon as we won the competition, we immediately went into the wind tunnel with our competition scheme. Because, because we needed to understand what was going on and how the building was, was going. And I remember uh, uh, sitting there with, uh, after we got our first set of data back from the wind tunnel, sitting there in, in my office in Chicago with uh, uh, Peter Irwin, who's here, and Adrian and I, and, and we were looking at the data, and, uh, and uh, SOM, we'd taken some of the data from RWDI and we'd recast it a bit. And we were looking at the data, and we were looking at the plexiglass model, and we were looking at the data, and we were looking at the plexiglass model, trying to figure out where, where we because we were getting, we had very, we had, a, we had some big forces. We were trying to figure out where they were coming from. And, 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 and we, we started to discover these things. The, the building has essentially six directions. It has three noses. You can see where the pointed areas are. And when the wind blows at a nose, it acts like a cut water. The, the, the wind just flows around smoothly, and, and it's a very benign behavior. And then, when the, and then we have three tails, which is the, uh, is, is the area between uh, two uh, wings. And so when the wind hits, hits a tail, uh, you, you start to get a large vortex shutting. And we, and we found that there was uh, one direction that was more lively than the, than the rest. And, and Adrian was talking about this earlier. Uh, and so uh, and it was the, the C tail. Uh, the, because of the setbacks, that we, we, did, we named the wings A, B, and C. Was the C tail was the lively one. And so what we did is we took that information and we looked at the probabilistic basis of the wind and we turned the building. So, so, we, so we, we took the building and we pointed the lively direction where the wind doesn't blow to, 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 uh, 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 to avoid that problem. And then uh, the building initially, the setbacks happened counterclockwise. And then through analyzing the data, we, we, we determined that actually if we stepped it clockwise, we could reduce the forces a lot. And, and that's what we did. And, and so, so here you see all the tiers, all these different, different uh, floor plates that actually have different vortex shutting. And, and here you see a, a comparison of two of the wind tunnels. The one on the left is our very first test. And you see that red line? That's the storm that happens once in 100 uh, uh, years on both of these. And the one on the right is, is, is the third wind tunnel test. And, and, and you see that, that hump on the, on the one on the left, you see that kind of... Uh, I don't know what color to call it, kind of reddish uh, hump there, kind of purplish hump. Uh, see how high that hump is. That, that's because we had big forces. And after we'd done all this reshaping, look at the right. The forces had gone way down. We'd actually reduced the forces tremendously. And, because, and we were doing this to, for the economy of the structure, 
but it also reduces, uh, because F equals MA, it also reduces the, the, the motion perception uh, of, of the structure. And so, so uh, here's, here's the progression that Adrian was talking about earlier. Uh, where we were five years ago, or almost five years ago, to, to uh, as it progressed, and actually the building kept getting taller as we were building it. Okay, <laughs> the uh, you know, so we we uh, we would, uh, keep going back and back, and uh, as because we kept on the forces kept getting smaller and smaller through all these uh, all these uh, refinements, and we said, well, we can go a little taller. And, and here you see uh, see some of the models that that, that we did. Uh, it's one of the, the, the first one on the left there. So an intermediate one on the right, and one of the later ones in the middle there. Uh, then what we do is, now once we understand the wind, then we, uh, using some pr programs we developed, we can actually tune a building like a musical instrument. We look at what's residual harmonics around the wind, and then we, uh, we, we proportion it in such a way that we, uh, we hit the, uh, the, our target periods. And, and so we end up with a very, a very well-behaved building where we... Uh, we have, the, here's the translations and the torsion. And here, it says on here the torsion is the, is the third mode. It's actually the fifth mode. It, it's pretty, pretty rare. The, um, uh, and then we did a whole series of, of aeroelastic tests to see how an aeroelastic test is, is, a, is a model of the building which actually simulates the actual structural properties of the building. And, uh, and uh, you have it all highly instrumented. It's a fairly sophisticated test. So we did a whole series of those. The, um, and, and, and here, here, you, here you see the model. Uh, and, and we are a uh, big believer in peer reviewers. Uh, we were peer reviewed by uh, Joe Colasso. Um, the uh, foundation, uh, there was a peer review uh, by Clyde Baker. Uh, and uh, we even had a peer review on the wind tunnel. Uh, uh, University of Western Ontario uh, peer reviewed the uh, RWDI test. But, but, but here, here you see, see this model of the building. It's very, very important. And, and for you designers out there, one of the things we found is you really need to do this kind of model because we were finding that some of the higher modes, you know, the, 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 not the fundamental modes, but the higher modes are the ones that were controlling like a, from, the, from the above the bottom third, the top two thirds of the building. Okay, integration of systems. Uh, these buildings are Swiss watches, okay? Uh, you, you have to get everything in there and it's, and, and it's all got to fit. And, and yes, that's my watch right here, you see. The, uh, and and to, to do this Swiss watch, you have to have, have here's my team picture, Adrian's got his team picture. Uh, you know, so, so here, here we are, you can see, we actually, I forgot to tell you, we built a copy of Burj Dubai in Chicago. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's there, it's there, it's, it's there on the, it's on the West Loop, you know. Uh, the, but, you know, it, it, we, I think at, at peak we had about 90 people uh, uh, working this between the, uh, you know, the uh, architects, the structural engineers, the MEP engineers, the uh, interior designers, uh, you know, it was, you know, spec writers, document control people, it, it was a huge, huge team. And, and this is the product. It's, it, it, this is the Swiss watch. Uh, you know, uh, you know uh, we ended up producing drawings where, where we, f we figured out where every hole had to be. Uh, you know, here's some of the, uh, the plans where we did what's called Builders Works drawings. And so um, uh, the SOM engineers, structural engineers, the MEP engineers, working with uh, Pete Weissmetal, who's here today, are uh, coordinated just again and again and again. So, so here's like all the holes, and then here's the structural drawings showing uh, where those holes are. Just everything was worked out. Uh, you know, we figured out uh, you know, the link beams, what, what had to penetrate uh, through the link beam, and what could go below the link beam. And then finally, the core. It's a thing of beauty. You cannot believe how long it took us to get this core to work. We did, I, I don't know, hundreds of schemes, probably. I mean, you know, trying to, trying to get all those elevators to fit. And, and, and you're talking about the efficiency of the building. Every elevator in this building is inside that center hexagon. Every one. And we keep recycling the shafts. Uh, and, and one of the things, uh, uh, structurally, uh, we wanted to have the, uh, at the mechanical floors, we wanted the, the space to be high enough that we could tie the building together. And then Pete Weissmuller said, well, if you do that, I can now stack my elevator pits over my machine rooms, and I can keep recycling my shafts. And, and so uh, because of that, we were able to have m all these uh, multiple elevator uh, banks that, uh, that, uh, that, that stack uh, one on top of the other. And, and, you know, we spent a lot of time on this one. The, um, and, then, uh, and then, of course, there, there's, there's tons of special studies that uh, we ended up having to do. Uh, we, we would have to cons we constructed the building uh, in the computer to see how the how uh, the forces would be redistributed based on on the uh, the Samsung uh, provided construction uh, sequence. 
Uh, we would see how the forces, uh, due to creep and shrinkage, would, would move from the, uh, as the concrete uh, creeped, it would, uh, the forces would move into the rebar, and what that, what that did to the force distributions. Uh, we, we commissioned the University of Illinois to do some special studies to uh, prove, uh, to kind of implement or peer review our, our link beams, I'm sure that we could uh, have a sufficient, uh, a quite a, actually quite a bit of excess capacity in our structural elements. And, and then uh, we even did a Reynolds number test, okay? And so here's a little model that we have uh, that, that was, that was uh, done by RWDI. It was just something they put together, you know? The, uh, yeah, it actually, this is, this is, in the, is in the nine meter tall uh, wind tunnel down in Ottawa. And, and this was just a test for Reynolds number, which the engineers who's had fluid mechanics will understand what that is. But uh, it's one of the things you have to do when you do uh, scale model testing of tall buildings, you gotta be sure that, uh, that th this, is, this is correct. Finally, construction technology. As, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if we were to have uh, done this building, you know, a few decades ago, it'd probably be a steel building, okay? Uh, and, and one of the reasons for that would have been because of the speed of construction. Uh, you, you know, because uh, you got a lot of floors to build and you need to build them quickly, as you know, as developers always tell us, time is money, okay? And so, so you, you gotta get it online. Uh, and it's kind of interesting, uh, uh, with, the, with the concrete uh, technology you have today, uh, it's very, very sophisticated. And I, th and I think part of that is a lot of times the, the prime contractor is basically a concrete contractor, okay? And because of that, th it's to their uh, benefit to be very innovative, okay? Because uh, if, if they can save, uh, you, know, uh, you know, half a day a floor or, you know, uh, th you know through the life of a project, that's, that, that helps them greatly with their, with their profit. And it's kind of interesting, uh, uh, they, we started the, uh, the uh, superstructure of this building uh, three years ago, uh, next month at, in, uh, in April, and so we're up to 160. But, but uh, modern con concrete technology is, is, is like machines. Uh, you know, we have huge high capacity piles. Here we have the very proud Mark Amaral standing next to our 6,000 ton pile load test. <laughs> the, uh, and, and amazingly, we couldn't fail the pile. We were actually kind of disappointed. You actually want to fail the pile so you know what your capacity is, but we never were able to fail the pile. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, as everyone knows here, uh, the, uh, one of the problems with construction in the Middle East in the past has been corrosion. The groundwater here is unbelievably corrosive. It eats concrete and it eats rebar. And so uh, we use very high quality uh, uh, concrete and cathodic protection. Uh, here you see a titanium mesh that was put under the raft uh, uh, as part of the cathodic protection system uh, in order to, to, put a, to, to suppress the, uh, the, the corrosion. Uh, EMAR asked uh, to be sure that the building would have uh, a life uh, in excess of 100 years. And, and through this system uh, and through maintenance of the, uh, of the cathodic protection system, it can be a great deal longer than 100 years. It, you know, as long as you keep maintaining it, actually, it can go indefinitely. There's no, there's really no limit. Uh, we, we did some, uh, here, here are our test cubes, okay? They only have to be about 3.7 meters on the side, test cubes. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we, we had to test the, the concrete for heated hydration so that when we, we of course, uh, we always find that when we do these really massive concrete pours, they always want to do it in the middle of the summertime, okay? So this job was no different. So, so, we're, so we're out there, uh, so we had to be sure we had a concrete mix that wouldn't get so hot during, during the casting operation, uh, and, and we were able to do that. Uh, so we did these giant test cubes with full of thermal couples to be sure that, uh, that uh, it wouldn't generate too much heat uh, as, as the concrete uh, set up and cured. The, uh, and finally, uh, we got into uh, pouring the foundation. We used a very sophisticated concrete mix called uh, self-consolidating, self-compacting concrete. Uh, it, just just an, an amazing materials. And, and then this was kind of fun. Uh, I'm sure uh, Samsung will talk about this later. Is uh, okay? They said uh, we, we got to be sure that we can pump this concrete over 600 meters. And I said, okay. How do you test that? <laughs> and, then, and then here's what they did. They, out on the desert floor, they, 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 they laid all these pipes out. And every time, from hydraulics, every time a pipe go, uh, you pump a fluid through a pipe, every time you go around a bend or something, you get a pressure loss. And if you can get enough pressure loss, it's equivalent to pumping it uh, six, uh, 600 meters. Okay? And so what they did, and so they, they went through a whole bunch of different mixes to be sure that after they pumped the concrete through this 600 meters, it was still concrete when it came out the other end. 
and, and so they, they were able to, um, able to prove the mix. Uh, and then finally, the formwork systems. This is the thing that concrete has now that it used not to have. It's a vertical factory. You, know, you, you build it like a machine. It, you have all these formwork systems that, ride, that, that, pull, that climb themselves up. And, and, and we were very, very careful to be sure that, that uh, the formwork could, could be reused uh, from the very beginning to, to when uh, that part of the building termin terminated. So, so you got this, this high efficiency uh, of, the, of the construction. The, and and uh, here, here, you've all seen this. Uh, here's, here's the building and, and where we, we are today. And what's amazing is you don't really appreciate how tall it is until you're up in the tower, okay? The, um, uh, when, when, you're, when you're up on the top of the building and you're looking down at everything is when you really feel how tall the, the building is. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is the man we're looking to. Uh, he, I think believe he's speaking later this morning, uh, K.J. Kim. Here's a photograph we took uh, uh, about uh, three years ago. And, and this, this is pretty, pretty typical. Here's SOM and uh, Hyder and Turner and B6. And we're all looking at this one man, uh, K.J. Kim. And, and, uh, uh, and K.J. has an interesting thing. He built one of the t Petronas Towers before he did this thing. So, so he's a, here's a man who can say he built the world's tallest building twice. And, and then finally, uh, many, many firms were involved. Uh, of course, uh, Imar uh, as the owner who, who gave the vision and, and the can-do attitude uh, to the project. Turner, who was the project manager. SOM as uh, who, uh, you know, did the design and working drawings for the uh, uh, architecture, structural engineering, MEP drawings. Um, uh, Heider, who, who's, who's the local associate, uh, who, uh, and also did the geotechnical engineering on the, on the project. RWI, uh, of course, Samsung was a, a, a mixture of Samsung B6 and Arabtech, and then a multiplex on, on the foundations. So the address, it, it's, it's a very incredible project. Thank you very much.